Hey guys, welcome to our channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Luz Maria Lopez, from love to violent crime. The crime rate in Guatemala is extremely high. According to statistics, at least 100 crimes are committed here per week, half of which are so-called domestic crimes, and almost 70% of serious crimes remain unsolved. According to The New Yorker, fewer civilians died in the Iraq war zone in 2009 than in Guatemala. It was in this beautiful but dangerous country that the tragic events that will be discussed today took place. The story of an attractive young woman named Luz Maria Lopez started out romantic and promising, but ended up as a handful of ashes in a bag thrown down a sewer manhole. She was victimized by a domestic tyrant whom she herself spent years forgiving over and over again, giving him a chance to mend his ways. There was a lot of controversy in this case, and the perpetrator could have avoided responsibility, but let's go over everything in order. Who is Luz Maria Lopez? The full name of our today's heroine, given to her at birth, sounds like Luz Maria del Rocio Morales Lopez. She was born in 1995, March 17th, in the small town of San Cristobal, Verapaz, in a simple and rather modest family of Ada Morales and Brian Lopez. Luz Maria was the youngest of two children of her parents and was raised with her older brother Omar. As an infant, the girl nearly died due to an intestinal obstruction. To save her life, a complex operation was performed and doctors gave no guarantees. But the baby's mother prayed for her recovery and believed that her daughter would recover. So soon and happened, and the surgery itself at such an early age, fortunately did not affect the development of the girl. During her school years, Luz Maria was actively engaged in sports, in particular, attended sections of gymnastics and athletics, and was also fond of classical choreography. She was a creative person, easily found a common language with different people and quickly made friends. The girl also studied well and had an aptitude for the humanities. After graduating from school, Luz Maria thought about getting a higher education and decided to enter a prestigious state university. She chose law and later decided to specialize in criminalistics because this direction has always aroused her genuine interest. A Fateful Encounter when Luz Maria was a student, she and her mother visited a car dealership in Coban, the capital of Alta Verapaz. It was her older brother's 25th birthday that year, and her parents and sister wanted to give him a special gift, a motorcycle, which he had long dreamed of. In the showroom, they were met by a polite and very attentive young consultant who introduced himself as Jorge. He showed the buyers the whole assortment and gave some recommendations. Mother and daughter chose a model, but decided to think more and consult with the head of the family. Leaving, they took a business card of the car dealership, and also Luz Maria left her phone number for feedback. Soon the girl received a call from Jorge, the same consultant from the salon, but the conversation was not about the upcoming purchase, but was more of a personal nature. After that, Jorge dialed Luz Maria's number several more times before he dared to ask her out to a coffee shop. It was obvious that he liked the beautiful, sultry brunette very much, but he did not know where to begin the acquaintance. It should be noted that Luz Maria also liked this handsome young man, so on his proposal to meet, she responded with consent. The guy was a year younger than her, but such a small difference in age was not an obstacle for them. Almost immediately a romantic relationship began between them, which developed rapidly. Both felt that it was true love at first sight and believed that a long and happy life was ahead of them. After only a few months, the couple decided to live together, and although their parents did not approve of such a rush, the young people were soon married. About six months later, the lovers played a wedding, inviting only the closest people to the celebration. Curiously, the problems began on the day of the wedding, when the institution where the banquet was to be held there was a hitch because of which the holiday was almost derailed. The couple had to overpay a considerable amount of money so that the wedding, after all, took place at the appointed time. Who is Jorge? About who was the chosen one of Luz Maria, there is very little information in the public domain. It is known that he was born in 1996 
in the town of Santa Catalina La Tinta, which is in the central part of Guatemala. Jorge was the eldest of two sons and was raised with his brother Pablo. His family balanced on the brink of poverty so that the boys as children were not spoiled with beautiful clothes and expensive toys because the money was enough only for the bare necessities. But Jorge somehow did not aspire to a better life, so he did not bother to study and look for a decent job. The young man, as they say, just went with the flow. People who knew Jorge personally spoke about him as a withdrawn, uncommunicative, and sometimes aggressive guy. He really had problems with controlling emotions, because of which Jorge did not have many friends and poorly formed relationships with the opposite sex. Nevertheless, when he met the girl of his dreams, he made every effort to win her love, and then he was in a hurry to get married, fearing that she might change her mind. By the way, the parents of Luz Maria from the very beginning treated her son-in-law with suspicion. There was something about this young man they definitely did not like, but they could not say what it was and could not dissuade their daughter from marrying him. An Unhappy Marriage Soon after the wedding, the young wife became pregnant, but since she had not yet managed to get a university degree, she could not find a good job. No one wanted to take a girl with no experience who was in an interesting position, so she had to make do with casual labor. Her husband by that time and lost his job, but was in no hurry to burden himself with a new occupation. When the couple had a daughter, who was named Alice, with money in the family was quite tight. Both spouses were unemployed. They had no money, not only to pay for rented housing, but even to buy food and the most basic things needed in the household. Then Jorge convinced his wife that the only way out for them would be to temporarily move to live in his parents' house. Luz Maria refused for a long time, but since they had no choice and they could not stay on the street with a baby in their arms, the young woman eventually agreed. Ada knew about the problems in her daughter's family and repeatedly persuaded her to return to her native home, but she persisted in saying that everything would soon get better with her husband and there was no reason to worry. One day the mother decided to visit her daughter and granddaughter, but coming to the house of her son-in-law's parents, found there a frightening picture. Luz Maria was in a deplorable state. She ate only once a day and then a little. Jorge's family did not think it necessary to feed their unemployed daughter-in-law. Luz Maria was breastfeeding her young daughter, so malnutrition could affect not only her health, but also the health of the child. However, the meager food was only a small part of all the troubles and problems Luz Maria faced in her mother-in-law's home. As it turned out, there she was constantly humiliated and even beaten by her husband's younger brother. This guy was annoyed by the crying of the child, as well as the presence of children's things in the house so much so that he repeatedly threw them at Luz Maria, and once, once again launched a baby bottle at her and hit little Alice, who was in her mother's arms. Jorge saw all this, but never once stood up for his wife and daughter, and acted as if they were strangers to him. Ada convinced her daughter to take her granddaughter and return to her parents' house, but soon Jorge appeared on their doorstep, asking his wife to return and promising to get a job. She agreed but only after the young people were able to rent an apartment and live separately from Jorge's parents. When Luz Maria defended her diploma, she was able to fulfill her longtime dream and got a job in the city prosecutor's office. A smart, talented, and very responsible young woman, she quickly gained the respect of her colleagues and gradually began to move up the career ladder. Over time, the family's financial situation improved considerably, so much so that the couple could afford to buy a car for two. However, this was solely the merit of the wife, who worked hard, spared no expense, and was well regarded by her superiors. Jorge was still in search of himself, and preferred to live at the expense of his wife, jealous, lazy, and a domestic tyrant. The young husband had an explosive temper, and the situation only worsened with time. He did not want to work, interrupted by temporary part-time jobs, and even then, not often. He preferred to sit at home in front of the TV, drinking beer with friends and spending what his wife earned. In addition, Jorge was pathologically jealous and tried to control every move of his beloved. He did not allow her to make friends, to have lunch with colleagues in cafes, or just to be somewhere without him. 
He constantly checked her phone, looked at the history of calls and read messages, and also forbade her to register accounts in social networks. At home, when left alone, the husband behaved no better. He made scandals in the middle of nowhere, constantly clarified relations, and always blamed his wife for all the problems and family troubles. When they lived in the house of his parents, Jorge never stood up for his wife and just watched how she humiliated, insulted, and sometimes even beat his relatives. Jorge himself also occasionally gave the will of his fists and did not see anything wrong in it. He treated Luz Maria as his property, believing that she would endure everything and would not go anywhere from him. Neighbors often heard the screams coming from the house of the couple, as well as saw on the face and body of the young woman signs of beatings. Repeatedly, Lopez tried to leave her husband and wanted to file for divorce. She several times took her daughter and moved out of the rented apartment in the house of her parents, but her husband every time came there and literally on his knees begged her forgiveness. And each time Luz Maria forgave him, giving him another chance, even though her parents asked her to come to her senses and leave this abusive man. On December 15, 2020, after another fight with manhandling, Luz Maria took three-year-old Alice, got into the car, and came to her mother in tears. A day later, Jorge arrived there, and it was unclear whether he wanted his wife or the car back. He said that he had found a job, and now their lives would change, and he also swore that he would never raise a hand on his wife again in his life. Surprisingly, Luz Maria believed him again, and went with her husband to their rented apartment. In mid-January 2021, Luz Maria called her mother to complain that her husband had not only failed to get a job as promised, but had also stolen the money she had earned, effectively leaving the family destitute. Ada felt sorry for her daughter and said she would give her some money so that she and her granddaughter would have enough for everything they needed until her daughter received her salary. The women agreed to meet on the morning of January 19th, but Luz Maria did not arrive at the appointed time. Moreover, she did not answer phone calls and messages, which was unusual for her. Concerned, Ada decided to go to her daughter's workplace the next day, but there she learned that Luz Maria had not shown up for the second day and that no one had been able to contact her. At the same time, Jorge, who was also looking for his wife, arrived at the prosecutor's office. According to him, they had once again quarreled, and he thought that Luz Maria had gone to her mother's house and was not answering her calls because she was offended by him. Ada immediately sensed something wrong and assumed that her son-in-law was lying, so she went straight to the police so that the search for Luz Maria could begin as soon as possible. That same day, an alert system was announced nationwide under the code name Isabel Claudina, in the original Alerta Isabel Claudina. This meant an emergency search for a young woman reported missing. When the massive search began, the missing woman's husband was the first person to be named as a suspect although it would be more accurate to say that he was the only suspect in the case. Luz Maria had no enemies. There was no reason to believe that she had been kidnapped, and the last person who saw her alive was Jorge. Naturally, this guy denied his involvement in the case, claiming that he himself was knocked down in search of his wife, and now extremely indignant and annoyed by the fact that he became the main suspect. At the same time, he himself was constantly confused in his testimony and could not clearly explain why he did not inform the police about the disappearance on the day of his wife's disappearance, and if he thought that she was at his mother-in-law's house, why he did not call or go there. While the police were searching for witnesses and combing the area, the body of the missing Luz Maria was accidentally discovered by municipal workers. On January 22nd, Several workers arrived to a call about a clogged storm drain near the road. When they lifted the grate, they saw a strange large plastic bag with something black in it. As they looked closer, they realized that what they were looking at were charred human remains. They immediately reported the gruesome discovery to the police, and the police officers who arrived suggested that the body found could be that of Luz Maria Lopez, who is wanted all over the country. Forensic experts confirmed that the remains belonged to a young woman and her parents and brother at the identification, despite the fact that the body was badly disfigured by fire, confirmed with certainty that it was her. 
It is noteworthy that the package was found on the same street where the building of the prosecutor's office, where the deceased worked, was located. Except that there were no surveillance cameras, as well as lighting, in that place. Despite the fact that the body was badly burned, pathologists were able to establish that the woman was severely beaten and the cause of her death was asphyxia. This was evidenced by internal hemorrhages, several fractures sustained while she was still alive, and particles of caked blood in her nose and mouth. There were deep marks on her neck indicating strangulation. It's a strange message. At the time of the discovery of the body, no new suspects had emerged in the case, and the victim's parents had no doubt that it was the son-in-law who had so brutally murdered their daughter. Jorge was immediately taken into custody, and the motive for his heinous act was being investigated. Also, psychologists' criminalists had to analyze in detail this marriage and the relationships formed within the family. At the investigation, Ada Lopez provided a frightening audio recording, which was sent to her anonymously by someone who lived in the neighborhood with her daughter and son-in-law. Apparently, this person has repeatedly witnessed the family scandals of the couple, and this time decided to record their quarrel, not suspecting that everything will end in a brutal murder. The audio recording clearly shows Luz Maria desperately screaming and crying for help, while in the background little Alice sobs in the background. Ada was horrified by what she heard. She stated that if that witness had called the police right away, her daughter might be alive right now. The man who made the recording not only did not call the police, but did not even visit the house from which the horrible screams were coming. The police also failed to trace the anonymous person, so it was not possible to involve him in the investigation as a witness. The audio recording was attached to the materials of the criminal case, and Ada gave a big interview, during which she called on all citizens to be vigilant and report to the police about the revealed facts of domestic violence, and not just to film them on camera or record them on a dictaphone. According to the woman, such simple actions will help save someone's life. This high-profile crime caused a widespread public outcry, and thousands of people took to the streets, staging rallies across the country to demand that the killer be punished. Although Jorge was taken into custody almost immediately, he continued to deny his guilt, saying that he personally drove his wife to work that fateful day, after which she disappeared. Street CCTV footage did indeed show the couple's car traveling in the direction of Luz Maria's workplace that morning. However, due to the tinted windows, it could not be clearly established how many people were in the car. Also, none of the recordings showed the car stopping and Luz Maria getting out of the cabin. The next curious discovery was made at the couple's rented home, where numerous washed-out traces of blood and drag marks were found. This suggested that this was where the brutal crime had taken place. Suspicions were confirmed when microscopic fragments of burnt flesh were found in the trunk of the family car. In addition, during the search, the investigator was interested in the recent purchase made by the couple, namely, a double orthopedic mattress. More precisely, not even the mattress itself, but the dense polyethylene in which it was wrapped. As the comparative analysis showed, it was in it that Jorge had packed the burnt remains of his wife. It was also possible to find several witnesses from among the neighbors of the family who repeatedly heard Jorge insulting his wife and threatening her with death. A few days before Luz Maria's sudden disappearance, her husband had shouted that he would kill her if she decided to leave him and that he would hide her body so that no one would ever find it. The Picture of the Crime Based on the data that managed to collect expert criminologists, as well as relying on the testimony of several witnesses, the investigation of the pieces restored the gruesome picture of the crime. The murder occurred on the night of January 19th, 2021, the day before the spouses had a big fight, and Jorge again gave the will of his fists. He had problems with controlling outbursts of anger before, but this time he simply went into a rage. He hit his wife several times, causing her to scream and cry for help. It was these screams that the neighbors of the family heard, but did not call the police. In the process of beating, Jorge broke his wife's nose and also caused her a head injury. After that, he strangled her with his bare hands and then attempted to dispose of the corpse. To do so, he dragged the body out into the backyard 
doused it with campfire liquid, and set it on fire. However, Jorge did not expect his funeral pyre to be so smoky and the stench of burning meat and hair to eat away at his eyes. He was afraid that the neighbors would notice it, suspect something wrong and call the fire department or the police. So he quickly put out the fire, wrapped the burnt remains in plastic, and then went to find a secluded place where he thought the body would never be found. The most horrible thing was that Jorge committed all these atrocities in front of their young daughter, who, due to her age, although not fully, but understood what was happening. The child, who was three and a half years old at the time, saw the beating and the crime, as evidenced by the child's cries and screams, which were also caught on tape. Jorge, who had some knowledge of forensics thanks to his wife's textbooks, which were in abundance in their home, tried to cover up the crime and establish an alibi. He found a stretch of road where there were no lights or video cameras and dumped his wife's body in a drainage sewer there, going unnoticed. The next morning, he drove to her place of work along the usual route, as if he had driven Luz Maria there, as he did every morning, and the next day he began to simulate an active search for his wife, calling her colleagues, acquaintances, and relatives. Trial and Verdict The criminal's lawyers delayed the trial as much as they could, and also tried to throw the investigation off track. They insisted that all the evidence and witness statements were circumstantial, and there was not a single piece of evidence that would unequivocally prove Jorge's guilt. Defense attorneys tried to get the detention changed to house arrest, and also argued that Jorge himself was deeply depressed by the fact that he was accused of killing the woman he loved and the mother of his child. However, the decisive evidence was the data obtained from Luz Maria's phone. All this time, the gadget was in her husband's possession, and on the first day after the crime, he sent from it several messages to different people, trying to create the appearance that Luz Maria is alive. Also having tracked all the movements of the smartphone that day, it was clear that it was constantly in the same places as Jorge's phone. But the lawyers tried to turn this evidence in favor of their client, saying that he found his wife's phone and drove around the city with it in search of her. But no one could explain why Jorge was sending messages from it, as well as calling it from his own cell phone. Another proof of the defendant's guilt was the bruises and scratches on his body, found on the day of his arrest. These marks were recorded by experts on photos and indicated that the victim had clearly resisted. The most vivid was a scratch on his neck, but only to find particles of Jorge's epithelium under the fingernails of the murdered could not be found because they were destroyed by fire. But despite the large number of controversial points, the prosecutor asked for the maximum possible punishment for the perpetrator. Court hearings and proceedings were repeatedly postponed due to the raging worldwide pandemic of coronavirus, but in October 2022, the defendant was finally found guilty of the brutal murder of his wife. The man was sentenced to 50 years in prison, although he himself did not admit his guilt. Custody of little Alice was given to her maternal grandparents, who admitted that now the main meaning of their lives is their granddaughter. Thanks for watching guys, Jack was with you. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click on the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.